peak, peak season this year. And a round table on a dramatic increase in ship orders. But is it too many too soon? All that and more coming up on Freight Waves Now. Monday edition of Freightways Now, I'm Anthony Smith here with the one, the only, Sydney Edwards. Glad to be reunited. Yes, we're back together again, Anthony. <laughs> <laughs> and on this Monday edition of Freightways Now, we'll have, of course, Mary O'Connell coming on to talk about how to know if you're buying the right tech for your business. And as always on this Monday, we have our hot seat segment coming up in the next hour. But we begin today with our top story coming out of Tesla, which the Tesla truck is going to hit a highway near you. We have Noe Mahoney joining us this morning for this story. Noe, thanks so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Noe, so tell us what's going on here. Tell us about this truck. When might we see it? Who's going to get it? Uh, so Tesla and Elon Musk announced its uh, semi uh, electric commercial truck way back in 2017 and uh, at the time uh, it was you know promised to revolutionize the commercial trucking industry and it was supposed to come to market in 2019 or that was for uh, but it was delayed uh, many times the past five years uh, supply chain issues there was a departure of a key executive from Tesla that was in charge of that division. But uh, this past Thursday, Elon Musk tweeted, as he usually does, he uses Twitter to make big, big announcements now, but he tweeted that uh, Semi is in production and PepsiCo will receive uh, the first deliveries uh, December, December 1. So it's finally here and it's a, a really big deal for the commercial trucking industry. A few questions around that and it sounds like December 1st is well, very definite, and it's right around the corner. So starting it off with why PepsiCo, why are they starting off with their first delivery with them? Uh, so I believe way back in 2017 or, or sometime around there, Tesla and PepsiCo came up with you know a deal uh, to get the first deliveries of the semi, and it's actually PepsiCo's Frito-Lay division that will be receiving, I believe, uh, 15 trucks, uh, semi trucks on uh, December 1, and they have a total order of 100 trucks, so it's not clear when they'll get the rest of those. But PepsiCo has been waiting, you know, I guess for, for years uh, with this deal, and, and Tesla has already built a supercharger on Frito Lay's, uh, I guess, headquarters or property in Modesto, California. So this is a, a big deal for them as well. I'm curious, with the years that have passed in the delays of this truck, what might have changed with the truck that we know we're now for sure going to see when this rolls out? Um, you know, some of the features, I know they improved the in interior uh, of the semi-truck, uh, adding more technology and, from what I've read, more uh, comfort for drivers. Uh, I know Tesla promises the truck will go from zero to 60 and, you know, and I forgot what it was, but very quickly, uh, and the gross weight of the truck is going to be 82,000 pounds, and uh, so I believe they've increased the uh, the battery ranges from 300. You can buy two versions. There's a 300 mile version and a 500 mile version, and the 500 mile version was was priced at 180,000, and I'm not sure if that price has changed, but uh, Tesla has improved, you know, technology just as. Uh, from, from five years ago. So so there is a lot of improvement. In it. And Noe, any s initial speculations on how much they'll be able to produce if this does really to kind of initially take off in the industry? Would they be able to fulfill large orders or would this just be almost like limited runs and definitely have to get your pre-orders in as a company? Um, you know, I, I can't answer that question because Elon Musk, is, as usual, doesn't really share uh, much information about what's going on within the company, but I do know that uh, one of the big improvements from five years ago uh, for Tesla, the company, is battery production. Uh, they are able to produce, I believe, more batteries, uh, and they're able to produce, uh, they've cut the cost on battery production for them, which is one of the reasons that it took so long to get the semi uh, to production to market. 
because they didn't want to take batteries away from their electric uh, passenger vehicles because one semi uses anywhere I've read from five to maybe five to nine or more uh, batteries in the semi. So those batteries that you're using for the semi could have potentially gone into uh, you know their passenger vehicles, which was their big money maker. But since they've been able to reduce the cost of producing batteries, uh, now they're moving into semi production, or that's that's what my research has shown me. Watching this uh, December first delivery uh, with bated breath, just to see how it all kind of goes. Uh, Noy, you have another top story coming out this morning around new regulations in Mexico. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, back in uh, May 2021, the Mexican government announced uh, new customs requirements, basically more paperwork, uh, electronic paperwork anyway, to try to uh, root out, uh, what do you call it? black market goods or uh, illegal shipments across the country in Mexico. And uh, so this document is called the Carta Porte Supplement, and it's about it's a document with 120 data points, uh, and everything from you know routes that you're taking through Mexico, what the, what the goods are, uh, who's shipping it, uh, when it's supposed to depart, when it's supposed to arrive. So it's it's basically another layer, more paperwork for shippers and carriers, but it's meant to, like I said, root out black market shipments or black market goods. But it's also another way for the Mexican government to collect more tax revenue. 120 data points. That is a lot to go through. Is there anything specific that you remember that points out to you? Uh, like I said, it's, it's the routes. You have to be very specific in what routes you're taking through the country. Uh, you, you can't really deviate from those routes from what I've been told. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's basically anything, you know, how much, what, what's being shipped, uh, the quantity, how much it weighs, you know, it's just, it's, it's everything about that one particular shipment. Um, and, the Mexican government, it's called the Mexican Tax Authority. The SAT is what it's called in Mexico. They're the ones that are uh, monitoring and uh, putting out this, this new tax requirement. They actually have or are supposed to have an app or uh, an electronic way to file this Carte de Porte supplement, but they haven't done a good job of rolling it out. And some people say, you know, that the technology that or their website is, is really glitchy. It doesn't work well. So it's really... Uh, it's not really going over well with the trade community in Mexico. And Noy, um, you mentioned a few things earlier, but there is some unintended consequences, like you said, really kind of dialing in and being able to collect more tax revenue for the Mexican government. Were there any industries or subsectors that were targeted specifically for the black market um, uh, regulation that's going into place right now? I believe from what uh, I've read and what people have told me, a lot of it was uh, apparel, uh, you know, manufacture of apparel, furniture, uh, stuff like that. It wasn't so much, you know, uh, like electric, uh, not electric, a car, it wasn't car parts or, or anything of that, that nature to a large degree. It was mostly like from what I've, from what I understand apparel and like furniture, home goods, home appliances. And anyway, how might this be regulated, implemented? What might change for the folks that are actually, you know, driving through and riding these uh, rails? Um, well, what one of the things that this tax supplement has done so far is it's really uh, added cost and time for shippers and carriers who are trying to, you know, ship anything across Mexico. Um, some people have told me that some companies have had to hire, you know, uh, a specialist just to be able to file this document. So that's another person you have to add to the payroll just to be able to, you know, uh, complete this requirement. So right there, that's an added cost. And, you know, the time it takes to fill out these documents uh, or this particular document adds time to any shipment. And, and as any shipper knows, time is money. So it's, it's basically adding cost and time uh, at this moment right now for shippers and carriers. And Noy, all this really kind of comes at a point where we really see Mexico ramping up, especially with partnerships in that region, with a lot of companies kind of, you know, targeting the area for its definite close, uh, closeness to uh, the U.S. 
does this kind of interfere with that really budding growth that we're seeing in Mexico at the moment? And you mentioned a lot of folks looking to be potentially hired just to deal with this. Do we have a long enough runway to um, really say when this does get launched to really be able to adjust to it? You know, that's a great question. Um, this year alone, 2022, Mexico has delayed the implementation, implement, implic, uh, I'm sorry, the start of this uh, document four times. So they've delayed uh, the start of uh, start of it uh, four four different times this year alone. And the deadline right now is December 31st for when for when it begins being enforced. And what happens is if you submit this document with errors, the uh, Mexican tax authority can fine you uh, anywhere from several hundred dollars on up. So, so if you file it incorrectly, you're going to be start. You're going to start to see fines after the December 31st deadline. And do you see this potentially as a, any way of deterrence to some of the countries looking to do business in Mexico or in the region? You know, it's curious. Uh, Mexico has been trying real hard to to show, hey, you know, you can nearshore here, you can put your factories here, and you know, we're an alternative to Asia, and so. I, I don't want to delve into politics, but I really don't understand the reasoning uh, behind this, you know, carte de porte supplement. It seems just another layer of, uh, of bureaucracy to put on traders uh, in the country. So it's, it's a very curious uh, development to me. No, thank you so much for joining us this morning. When is that article coming out? Where can folks find it? Uh, well, the uh, Tesla article came out last week uh, on Friday, I believe, and my article about the Carta Forte supplement uh, was featured yesterday in my Borderlands column. Awesome, Noe. Well, thank you so much for joining us this morning. I'm sure we'll check in with you again throughout this week, and we'll appreciate your insights, and we'll follow these stories closely. Thank you so much for having me. We now have our first check with our carrier update. We've got Tony Mulvey with us and Donnie Gilbert. Let's hear from him. Welcome into this carrier update presented by Uptake. I'm Tony Mulvey, joined by Donnie Gilbert. Donnie, you are wrong on your Oklahoma take, but you were right on seeing what diesel prices did over the weekend. I definitely went wrong with Oklahoma, but okay. Diesel, uh, a little bit worse than what I thought. Since the fourth, we've come up 16 cents a gallon. <clears throat> that's, pretty, that's a pretty big jump. Now, Tony, we, we said this, you know, you and I have discussed when rates of diesel goes up and down based on the, the split between the retail and the wholesale. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> we've kind of put that uh, comparison together. So with this happening, we see both rack and wholesale have jumped up. Rack being in orange, wholesale being in the blue. Let's go to the next uh, chart here. Look at our spread. It's even further down. It's down to 60 cents a gallon. So what does this mean for the, the rate of diesel fuel? <clears throat> it's going to continue to have upward pressure. So we could go, I don't even want to say, we could, you know, if the rack stops, we still have room to go up 50 cents yeah. to get this spread back to at least $1. And the problem is the rack price hasn't slowed down. I mean, if you look back at where it was, I think it was September 27th, it was right at $3.50, and it was $4.45. I mean, compared to the 16-cent jump we saw in the retail price, there is that room to run, and you see it right here. I mean, it, it, if to get it back to where we were, right? You know, in, in this area right here is where they're comfortable about keeping diesel fuel the same. And we're well below that. You know, we got yeah. almost below that Friday, and we knew then they were going to push rates up to get it. You know, we were down with 80, 81 cents mm -hmm. on Friday for the spread, and we knew they were going to want it a little bit higher between that 90 and 110. Yep. Well, now they've pushed it back up to get that spread, hopefully in the right direction, but it hasn't gone. Mm -hmm. So they're going to push this back up until this spread gets up between that 90 and dollar ten range. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you're going to see an acceleration, right, of diesel prices turning up. I mean, and it's not just the diesel market that's being affected, right? I mean, I, we were, I was talking about this this morning. It's like you start looking at gasoline prices too. They're starting to go up in that same direction. Maybe not as fast. It's going to be all oil-based products. Yep, exactly. It's the oil market itself that's being affected. All right, let's hop in here and look at the NTI. Uh, so uh, we saw a pretty good increase, Tony, mm -hmm. the NTI, but 
as we got over this hump for this uh, end of the month, end of the quarter, we have dropped pretty drastically here down to basically 161. We came back up a little bit over the weekend, but only, only the peak now is 264. Yep. And now, of course, maybe Monday and Tuesday, we may drop back down. Uh, now, this is for yesterday, so mm -hmm. that is one day old. So today, Monday and Tuesdays are fairly slow sometimes in logistics, and you'll see the rates drop a little bit, start picking up maybe Wednesday, but Thursday and Friday. So we can see this drop down for our, quote, trough uh, a lot lower. And this is going to start bringing down this 268 because these upward days are going to start ticking off with these lower days building in on our seven-day rolling average. So expect that to drop down pretty well as well. Yeah, and I think the problem with that, right, I mean, if you look back, we're, we're essentially the same place we were this time last month. And I think that's important. But like you said, you had the end of the quarter, end of the month, and a hurricane all happen. I mean, it all happened within, what, a, a couple weeks. of days of yeah. each other? There's not that catalyst in October, right? I mean, you start to think that you might see it start to pick up as the holiday season starts, you know, kind of middle of the month. You start to see upticks in freight volumes, but... I mean, if that doesn't pick up in any substantial way, like there's something that's going to prop this up. Our volumes have got to pick up to a degree to tighten up that excess capacity yeah. before we're going to see this turn around. And that starts October 15th. When will this be affected? Hope the sooner the better for carriers, mm -hmm. the later the better for shippers. We need to keep an eye on it and see. Absolutely. Well, Donnie, thank you so much for this update. We'll be sure to check in with you again a little later. Right now, we'll toss it over to Sydney Edwards with a look at this morning's top stories. With a first check of our headlines this Monday morning, I'm Sydney Edwards. Ocean carriers and marine terminals would be subject to stricter and potentially costlier billing requirements when they charge shippers for late containers under a proposal by the Federal Maritime Commission. The FMC's 58-page proposed rule on demerge and detention billing requirements, scheduled to be posted in the Federal Register next week, seeks to bring more clarity, structure, and punctuality, said the FMC, to the billing practices of vessel operating common carriers, non-vessel operating common carriers, in terminal operators. The billing parties would be required to issue the invoices to billed parties within 30 days from the date charges that stop accruing. The proposal would void charges to billed parties contained in invoices issued after the 30-day deadline. And for the first time in recent history, FedEx and UPS will likely not assume the same annual general rate increase as their competitor. After years of keeping its GRI between 4.9 and 5.9%, with a 6.9% increase, higher than many had expected, and the largest year-over-year -year increase in its history. UPS has yet to announce its GRI, and the jury is still out as to where it will fall. UPS releases its third quarter results on October 25th, and it's a reasonably safe bet it will publish its 2023 rates on or before that. Satish Jindal, the founder and president of UPS, could come in lower because it has a better handle on its cost structure than FedEx. Complying with California's AB5 law got another vote as the most likely note published by Cohen Transportation Analyst Jason Seidel. Now, Seidel had a, held a private roundtable discussion with unidentified executives who are likely to be affected by the state's restrictive law on independent contractors, as well as an attorney. Now, after the roundtable, Seidel published his report backing the brokerage model in which a trucking company transitions to being mostly a brokerage and brokers freight into independent owner operators. But those independent owner operators would need to get their own authority and insurance if they are now driving under the banner of a company providing those necessities. The other most likely option for complying with AB5, Seidel says, is making drivers employees, a step that was most visible in a recent decision by Universal Logistics. Now for those headlines and so much more, you can log on to FreightWaves.com. And if you're watching us on our YouTube channel, don't forget to like and subscribe for the full FreightWaves TV experience. You can head on over to TV.FreightWaves.com to get more. We'll have more after this break. Shipwell knows supply chains require plenty of prep. 
just like cooking. Without the right tools and ingredients, things don't turn out as planned. Luckily, Shipwell's advanced TMS solution has your recipe for success this produce season. A premium capacity network, end-to-end -end visibility, and the power to manage it all with one simple solution. Don't get burned this produce season. Satisfy your appetite for supply chain success with Shipwell. Join the shipping evolution. This is Efficiency in Action. It comes from XPO, being years ahead in experience and years ahead in technology. With artificial intelligence that helps us optimize how we roll our trailers, you first, and machine learning that accurately predicts market price fluctuation. World-class LTL freight transportation doesn't come from guesswork. It comes from precision. XPO, your freight first. What does this have to do with freight? Well, I'm glad you asked. People are wondering what's going to happen with inflation. Is there going to be hyperinflation? When is hyperinflation going to be here? When is there going to be inflation? What's going to happen with inflation? Inflation, inflation, inflation. <laughs> This is the sexiest topic within the economy right now. Welcome into Social Roundabout, everyone. I'm Isaiah Buchanan, and in this segment, we take a look at what's trending on social media. One of my biggest fears while driving is being on the interstate or a highway and my tire popping while being surrounded by other traffic. So what do you do or what does a truck driver do in that situation? Take a look at this video of a truck driver who, does, who handles the situation really well. I thought that that truck driver handled that whole situation really well. Um, he didn't try to overcorrect after the tire popped. He, he maintained his lane. He put on his uh, flashers to alert people around him that he was having an issue. And he got off to the side of the road where he was able to safely um, start working on that repair for that truck. Um, so if you ever have an issue like that, make sure you're not trying to overcorrect, do anything that could cause you to lose control of your vehicle. Uh, switching things up just a little bit, you know, it is Halloween season and people love to try to grow the biggest pumpkins. And a man in Massachusetts has done that. He officially has the biggest pumpkin in North America. This comes from the Topsfield Fair up in Massachusetts. This pumpkin weighed nearly 2,500 pounds, breaking the previous record of 2,200 pounds. I mean, look how massive that thing is. They had to use a... Uh, uh, 
oh, it's, it's escaping the name of me right now, what you use to pick up the pallets and whatnot. They had to use one of those to be able to even just move this thing around because it's so heavy. Um, so a forklift, that's what the thing I was looking for, people, not just a hat rack. So um, yeah, just really cool pumpkin. Um, this is actually the heaviest one in North America. Like I said, it's about 2,500 pounds. Uh, so shout out to that man who grew that pumpkin. Um, Props to you, my friend. That's all I have for this edition of Social Roundabout. But we'll be well, right now. We're going to take a look at last week's Running on Ice episode with Highway Hall looking for um, routes for drivers for reefer. I know when you and I were first talking about this this topic and getting into Highway Hall, we mentioned that there are still so many, whether it's farmers or larger companies, trucking companies, all the above, still using the pen and paper method, still using Excel sheets, still using other ways of, you know, getting their loads moved. And I know, I believe you said that I would be surprised at the, you know, the billion dollar companies that are also still using these methods. I just think it's crazy. It is it is crazy, I, and I'm surprised how they run that. I know Excel is a very powerful tool, <laughs> but you can save yourself. This is the I think our pitch to the shippers are guys, you focus on what you do best. Grow the freshest strawberries and the tomatoes and the cilantro and whatnot. Package them nicely for finding the right carrier and the transportation and the real time monitoring and tracking your freight. Leave it to a digital player like us, right, so to say, because that's what we do for a living and that's what you do for a living. And it can be a highly synergetic relationship by adopting the digitization that's happening at a huge, at a very fast pace as we speak. And I think I have read some of the freight phase reports as well, Goldman Sachs studies that, hey, this $90 billion of brokerage market is going to become $180 billion of brokerage market in the next probably six to eight years. Right now, we are, what, 5 to 7, less than 10% digital. And at that scale, we are talking about getting it to 50% digitally done. So a lot of upside for everyone. Is it possible to see, maybe on your end of things, what exactly is being moved? I'm curious if there's you're seeing more meat being moved currently or if it is more fresh produce or something else in the mix when it comes to you know, refrigerated freight that you're seeing being moved more. Right. As far as highway hall is concerned, yes, we are meeting all of the, we are moving all of the above commodities, right? We, are, we have, we are in Arkansas, we have, we are moving meat. Mostly we are moving the produce commodity because that's what is the most uh, bought uh, commodity in our ecosystem. So to answer your question, my observation as far as the highway hall business is concerned that we are moving more uh, uh, grocery items than the poultry items. <laughs> And I know that Highway Hall was established in 2018, so still had its footing just before the pandemic really started. I'd love to know how things, you know, changed for Highway Hall or for the cold chain in general that you saw as, you know, a big disruption. And maybe even more recently, of course, the war in Ukraine. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's what is the thing that and we all know that the prices of the food in general have risen. I mean the same time last year was the same time now, it, overall it has increased 11%. And right, X more than 40% probably. Milk has increased by more than 17%. And so overall. So what happened in COVID, uh, restaurants shut down, the food producers, producers lost a significant customer base, right? And the, but the consumer demand for grocery went up. So they were buying from the grocers or the local grocers and stores. So it took a while for the, food producers to divert their supply chain from, uh, you know, from the existing customers like restaurants to the grocery stores. And to top it off, reduce labor shortage and expanded demand. So that was a double whammy that we witnessed in COVID uh, times. And of course, we all saw what happened during that. And then after that, when it was settling down, the Ukraine war. So I don't know if we know, uh, I think I read somewhere that Russia and Ukraine are some of the largest wheat producers in the world. Probably more than 30% of the exports is coming from uh, these two countries. And exports from Ukraine were reduced by more than 90% mid last year to mid this year. Imagine uh, what kind of a wheat shortage globally that will accrue. And therefore, the prices of the flour and the starch and the commodities uh, rose. So, and, and of course, sanctions on Russia, I mean, uh, even the fertilizers. The fertilizers, 
uh, Russia is responsible for more than 30% of the exports of the fertilizers. And with all the sanctions, the prices of the overall uh, food production and the transportation costs increase because of all these reasons. It is so interesting. I just, it's going to be even more interesting um, once things hopefully settle down between Russia and Ukraine and we can kind of get back to maybe seeing where the supply chain is left after that. Yeah, exactly. Getting into more about what your customers are saying about your product, I'd love to hear any anecdotal stories you have, maybe on how this helps people's businesses or what they like most about it. Right. So A, overall, it is the ease of doing business and the fact that, hey, access to reliable capacity, and reliable is in double quotes pretty much, right? Because we have a very stringent carrier waiting process behind the scenes that can be booked with a couple of clicks and we will going to provide you with the full transparency and proactive updates throughout the trip of the load and then now the metric for the the most important metric for the shippers mostly are the otp the on-time pickup the on-time delivery and on time in full so i think based on the data i think if we the, the loads that we have moved through the highway hall ecosystem, we have reduced the load rejects by more than 80%. So if the loads were moved outside of the highway hall ecosystem with the traditional way, they were there would have been certain rejections, etc., amounting to certain dollars. But we have already started saving that by more than 80% because of the uh, way we uh, book the trucks and track the trucks and uh, deliver the and monitor it 24 by 7 through the sophisticated technology that we have built. We are built a digital brokerage platform behind the scene that is really utilizing a lot of, as I said, the algorithms, machine learning, and artificial intelligence methods to actually um, make sure that we are covering the loads at the right point in time and delivering with the right uh, metrics that the shippers want. When a customer comes to you, I'm curious if there's a universal issue they're currently dealing with or maybe something they're specifically looking for that they're hoping to get from Highway Hall when they say, you know, this is what we're doing right now. And, and you've heard that through, you know, multiple people. Right. So I think many of the, some of, most of the shippers that we have engaged early on, they were working with the traditional brokers, right? In which case that yes, technological adoption in their ecosystem, they do things more manually versus something that we can, take care of doing digitally, but I think data insights is something that nobody provides them uh, and by and large, right? So the fact that behind the scene, we may be integrated. This is a very connected platform that we are, A, our drivers are using the app. We are connected with several third-party applications behind the scene for the IoT-based temperature sensors or humidity, et cetera. So what we tell the shippers is, no matter what you use, you will always know for the highway hall moved loads that who's the driver, where's the driver, has he checked in, where's the proof of delivery, and uh, the, you know, in case of exceptions, we have an amazing 24 by seven human staff produce savvy professionals monitoring your freight. So we take care of all the exceptions on your behalf so that you can sleep peacefully and we leave it to the hands of somebody like <laughs> us and we will, if needed, we can recover your crew load. If there's a truck breakdown, we can actually come in and do the cross docking and things like that and make sure that you deliver your promise to your customer, which are typically the Walmarts and Costco's and Kroger's of the world. Now, visibility is the buzzword that we hear all the time now, especially when it comes to the cold chain, whether it's temperature monitoring or, you know, being able to find somebody to truly pick up your loads. There's a couple companies, of course, getting into the business. I know I just, like I just mentioned, temperature monitoring, especially I feel like we see a lot of companies really jumping on board with that. When it comes to maybe this type of, this type of business, what have you seen as the founder of it, as the creator of you know, this new product that has been maybe a frustration that other people are seeing and they're like, you know, for some reason I can't get over that, but you've created it, you've gotten over it, and you've made this a success. Yeah, I would say probably the incumbency, the fact that the industry is, A, of course, very relationship-driven. People have built their businesses over decades, right? And they know that they work with certain local players who they play golf with, et cetera, et cetera, right? 
So the adoption of digitization was initially slowed down because of those things. It was probably hard to break through the existing incumbent uh, players. But COVID sent a good signal to everyone involved that, hey, for you to thrive, you had to first survive. And what happened in COVID that we covered 100% of our loads when the load to truck ratio was as high as 20, 30, 40, or even more, 70s to 1, uh, so to say, right? So why? Because we do not work with six or seven or 10 or 20 carriers behind the scene who we have relationships with. We have tens of thousands of those reliable carriers drivers on our platform that we will find one of the many uh, for every time and every instant that you need. So I think the digital adoption has been slower, but now it's catching up because A, yesterday it was uh, COVID, today it is Ukraine war, and tomorrow will be something else. And I think that word is spreading fast now. is efficiency in action. It comes from XPO being years ahead in experience and years ahead in technology. With artificial intelligence that helps us optimize how we roll our trailers, you first, and machine learning that accurately predicts market price fluctuation. World-class LTL freight transportation doesn't come from guesswork. It comes from precision. XPO, your freight first. Shipwell knows supply chains require plenty of prep, just like cooking. Without the right tools and ingredients, things don't turn out as planned. Luckily, Shipwell's advanced TMS solution has your recipe for success this produce season. A premium capacity network, end-to-end -end visibility, and the power to manage it all with one simple solution. Don't get burned this produce season. Satisfy your appetite for supply chain success with Shipwell. Join the shipping evolution. FreightWaves is the number one source for transportation and logistics news. FreightWaves.com provides you with in-depth news coverage, data, and insights from the leading industry journalists and market experts. On FreightWaves.com, you can also watch the only streaming TV network dedicated to freight. FreightWaves TV provides you with coverage you won't find anywhere else. However you like your news delivered, check us out online or on the FreightWaves app. Welcome into this carrier update presented by Uptake. I'm Tony Mulvey, joined by Donnie Gilbert. Donnie, it is Monday, which means we are going to check out the reefer market. Yes, let's see how everybody's doing on reefer. All right, so in blue here, we have volumes. Now, if you look at volumes, Tony, through uh, the end of September, kind of a little, just barely down, just a little bit through September, and we've ticked back up here just the last three or four days. So really call this a wash. We've kind of at the same yeah. level. Volumes are flat. Uh, however, Tony, rejection rates have gone to the floor, down to 5.88%. Now, you and I have kicked back and forth on this, and we've never actually answered the question, when was the last time reefer rejection rates were down this low? Let's go to the next chart here. This, Tony, is where America was shut down. Yep. Where we was sent everybody home and said, don't go to work, go home, work from home. And this is that drop. This is the pre, this is the toilet paper and hand sanitizer <laughs> peak right before we went home. Yep. And then down, and then things started to pick back up. Tony, this is the only time that we've been down to this 5.88%. Yep. Now, this is in my accounting background, called an extraordinary event. Mm -hmm. Happens once in a lifetime and will probably never happen again. So I, we hope. I do not see us sending everybody home again like this. Yeah. So if you do not count this, Tony, then 
you do not see 5.88% no. except for where we are right now. No, and that's what I've been talking about. I mean, you look back at 2019 and we talk about it all the time from a carrier's perspective, 2019 was so rough. I mean, record number of bankruptcies going to Congress looking for a rate floor, and they were still at 10%. Yeah, so they got they got down just below 10%. Yeah. You're all correct. They never got below 9%. Yeah. So you are very correct. So we are almost half that right now. So this is some of the worst conditions that we've seen in uh, the reefer market rejection rate-wise. And all it means is that they're on auto accept. They yeah. are accepting the bigger carriers that a reefer are accepting everything they can get. Now, if we go to the next chart here right quick, uh, we'll see... Uh, reefer tender lead times. And this is kind of, has me scratching my head a little <laughs> bit. Um, we see that rejection rates are at its lowest, but we see that right now that reefer tender lead times are climbing back up. Yeah. And I don't have enough time to get all the way into this uh, on this episode right now, but basically rejection rates in the green line, that is how uh, carriers are reacting to the current situation of the markets. Mm -hmm. They see prices going down, uh, spot market rates going down, and they start falling back into compliance, and they start accepting those contracted loads. Now, outbound or reefer tender outbound lead times is a shipper's reaction to the current market conditions. So we can measure both of those. So when we see shippers typically pushing lead times out, that normally means they're under some type of pressure. And we're gonna look at that here on our on, on this, uh, section number three, just after the uh, break, the beginning of the, of the hour, and top of the hour, shall we say. And we're gonna see, are they actually under pressure right now? Or are they just following patterns from previous years because they don't have this knowledge. They don't have the market intelligence to see what all is actually changing. Absolutely. Well, Donnie, thank you so much for this update. We'll be sure to check in with you again a little later. Right now, we'll toss it back over to Sydney and to Anthony. Sydney and the other Tony. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Guys, thanks so much for that carry update. We'll be sure to check in with you again a little bit more throughout the morning right now. Sydney, we have to welcome on the magnificent, the one, the only Mary, Mary O'Connell. <laughs> <laughs> Mary, how are you? <laughs> I'm good. How are you guys? <laughs> we're good. It's a great Monday. We're just we're having fun up here today. <laughs> I can tell. I've never had such a, a extravagant introduction, and I think I'm going to have to request it every day now. <laughs> As I will the alderman of Chattanooga, you deserve it. And thanks so much for being here this morning. And Mary, we're getting into one of my favorite topics and one of the areas that I love to hear from you about, and that's going to be making sure that you're making the right investments into technology. And as our 3PL expert here at Freight Waves, what are gonna be some of the initial things that you're looking for when you're getting into that investment mindset? Yeah, so when you're looking to upgrade your technology in any way, shape, or form, um, you don't want to just go out and be like, oh, I saw an ad for that technology. Let's go ahead and buy that because that seems like a great idea. You definitely want to kind of take a little uh, introspection. You want to do some soul searching within yourself. <laughs> and then um, you really want to figure out what kind of problems you're facing. Um, all jokes aside, if you guys are have, if your company is having issues um, where your brokers aren't, think that they could get more done in the day, but it's taking them 10 minutes just to physically book the load in the computer system, well, then maybe start there. Start with something that's going to improve your quality of life and your, like, your ability for your workers to get their jobs done. If you start there, then you know that you're getting software that will actually benefit you, um, will benefit your company, and could potentially increase your margin and your revenue, which is something that nobody's really going to be upset about. So uh, thinking, just kind of taking a minute to look at the problems that you have, walk around, talk to people, say, hey, like, can I just sit with you for five, five, ten minutes, see what's going on? Um, like, if it's taking you five screens to get in and book one load, then we've gone, then we have a mistake. We have something that we have to solve here. Um, so it's really just looking at the software you currently have, what problems you have, and then also if there's any upgrades that you could make with something that you already have. A lot of times an upgrade is a lot easier. Like if, for example, a CMS came out with a new visibility tool, 
upgrading to that visibility tool is going to be a lot easier than implementing a brand new visibility tool. So kind of taking that holistic assessment of, okay, well, these are the problems I have. These are the resources at my disposal. What are some of those um, more of like cost efficient or cost effective ways to upgrade things that also keep my efficiency and my productivity up high? Now, Mary, you talk about load booking software. Might that be where we see the most frustration or where there's more of a lag, or is there another software that people need to keep in mind when they're talking about upgrades? Um, I mean, you can really, it's any of them. Um, I would say that your TMS is going to be your number one that you're going to want to focus on. That's the one that's going to have the most headaches potentially because it has the most people in it. It's got your pricing people. It's got your accounting people. It's got your um, carrier management people. It's got your account managers. It's got everybody in it. So if your TMS is really causing problems, then um, you're kind of not having a good day. Um, but if, um, but if the TMS is working for everyone else, but one group, for example, if your accounting problems, it's people are having problems with it, then maybe, you know, okay, well, I just need to look for like an accounting plugin, or maybe we need to look at how we do some internal processes. And, um, it could just also be that you're not using your software, how you originally, how it should be designed to be used. Like if you get something and you're like, Oh, okay. I, I like this software, I'm going to do this. And then it, um, you know, goes on the fritz or it doesn't necessarily work how you want it to. It's not the software's fault that it's not working. It's that you had maybe um, some false dreams or promises of what the software could do. And Mary, something that's taken me probably a little bit too long to realize in relationships, communication is everything. When investing in new technology, it's also a huge thing. So what kind of aspects do we need to take into consideration when looking at technology and how it works with backwards integration and really communicating with our already established systems? So a lot of it kind of comes down to um, just, uh, I don't know why, but some people in um, in like software or like some people just in negotiations and in those discovery calls, whether they are the person being discovered or doing the discovery, they just don't like to share all the information. And if you're working with someone that's going to be a potential business partner, not having all of that clarity and all that visibility and all that upfront honesty, that's only going to set people up for failure down the road so just be honest say this is what we're working with even if you're working with as 400 you can you can have something that will work and if you are having like if you have someone that's like oh this is the best technology this is the latest and greatest and it's going to work great and you're like okay well these are my tech these are my current tech capabilities they're like oh yeah it'll work no problem and then when you go to integrate and it's not working don't just continue to pay for a contract that you're not getting your full use out of. Like if it comes down to the integration and you are not able to fully utilize every tool that you have, don't pay for it. Like do not pay the full subscription price until your IT providers can work together and get something integrated, whether that's going through another third party system or another third party to have that connectivity feature. There are some out there that specialize in that, um, whether that's the option or whether it's just a matter of continuing to follow up on that IT team and those integration and implementation teams going, Hey, what's going on? Why is this not working? Like, do we have some sort of resolution? Don't let it get stuck in like that oh well we're just waiting for them to get back to us for six months like don't get stuck in that nobody needs to be in that just expect what you expect from all of your vendors and all of your partners which is fulfilling that contract and living up to the what they've promised you're saying it's okay to get what you deserve here <laughs> and to get the technology that you need because that's what's going to help <laughs> Exactly. Know your worth and get what you deserve. And if you are working with a partner that doesn't believe that you deserve that, well, then I think it's time that you find another partner. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mary. Now we're talking about applications too. Is there so much as too much of a good thing, too many things going on, too many apps in use? 
I know I feel like I just want one thing that does everything. That's the only thing I want to look at. Yes. <laughs> I mean, we kind of see it all the time now with, um, oh, download this app for this. You have to download this. Like even personally on our phones, like, oh, download this app to take a flight, download this app to like, if you want to go, for example, if I were to go to the airport, I'd have to have an app, an app for someone to come pick me up. I have to have an app to get on my phone and I have to use another app to get there. Plus any games that I play or anything else that I'm doing. It's just like, you kind of get that app overload, that app fatigue. And this is before even getting into like drivers that have to do it for each carrier or broker, you know, all of that craziness. So if it's internal software applications and you have to have, it kind of goes back to what I touched on a little bit earlier, where if you have someone that has to go through five screens and use five different applications for to book a load, you might have gone too far. Like just your software is supposed to help you and automate what you can and improve efficiency. And you're no longer efficient if you have to go through five screens to book one load. Like if you have to do all these different apps and then, oh, suddenly they don't work, there's no connectivity there, then you have to go backwards and it's just a nightmare. If it's turned into a whole ordeal, your apps are not solving the problem anymore. It's time to really look at what is happening and what those apps and what those values those value ads are and if you're not getting what you want out of those value ads it might be time to just cut that contract loose and say it's been a pleasure but i'm out like just shark tank style it (laughs) mary i think that's a great point and speaking of value ads what's the best way to kind of go around a cost analysis or, or that kind of thought when you think about integrating so many different apps or technologies and then maybe you're dedicating a resource or hiring for someone to just be that go-to person to really integrate all this. Is there any go-to ways or any tips for really kind of thinking about the cost analysis? I mean, it really kind of goes back to that holistic approach. Take a minute and look back to like, what are you, what, what, what problems are you trying to solve? Are you trying to solve I can't, I have poor visibility on my shipments because then you can get a visibility tool, but you'll still need someone to be there to monitor that and call anything that's late, et cetera, et cetera. So it kind of comes down to, are you going to throw people at the problem or are you going to throw money at the problem? If you're, if you have a problem that you have, um, and then you throw people at it. You're like, oh, well, we can just solve this by like having more people come and work here. Um, so if you want to do it that way, then you need the cost of hiring. How many people do you need to hire? What are their benefits look like? What do their salaries look like? What does their training look like? Because all those times that they're training, trying to get up to speed, that is money that they aren't necessarily bringing in, for lack of a better comparison. And then it also could be on the other side, okay, well, that cost of hiring four to five people to help work through this backlog, well, what does that look like if I were to get some sort of technology that would go in and maybe speed this up for everyone involved so that way I not only could free up people's time, I could free up a worker that, that I could put, I could assign them to another problem I have. So I don't necessarily need to hire five more people. I just need to kind of hone my processes, figure out what I want and, um, you know, just implement something that could truly help and deliver results. And that way you can free some, but you might be able to free somebody up to work on a special project or do some of those, um, those long-term plans that everybody's like, Oh, this would be great if we could do, but we just don't have time to do it. So if you can start working smartly that way, you don't have to necessarily like, it doesn't have to be a huge reorganization or anything like that. It's just using your resources effectively and to the best that you can. Mary, thank you so much for joining us this morning. And for those of you that don't know, Mary O'Connell is our 3PL expert, our writer and host of Check Call. So when can we hear more from you? When does Check Call come out? Uh, tomorrow, tomorrow, right here on Freight Waves TV, 1230, right after put that coffee down, you're going to want to just keep that coffee down or pick it back up, <laughs> you know, your choice, midday pick me up, um, right here at 1230 Eastern Tuesdays, you'll catch all episodes of Check Call, um, you can catch them on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, anywhere you get your podcasts, um, and then if you really can't get enough of Check Call, you can subscribe to the newsletter that comes out Tuesdays and Thursdays uh, to your inbox, so you literally don't have to go anywhere it'll 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 find you 
Awesome, Mary. Well, thank you so much for joining us this morning, and we look forward to that episode, and we'll check in with you again in a few moments throughout the week. Thank you, guys. Right now, we're going to take a quick break, but we will be right back with more Fruit Waves Now. Welcome back to another edition of Check Call, Check Call, Check Call, Check Call. Let's go. Nobody works for free, so why should we be expecting our drivers to? Okay, let's just get it together now. What are some of those proactive steps that you can start taking um, now for myself? I would like the earth to still be here for a little bit longer, but, right. you know, <laughs> is a hot dog a sandwich? <laughs> oh, okay. Is pizza an open face sandwich? It's bread. I have been ready for this question. <laughs> I've seen the show. We're all in this together. Thanks for making me hungry. Now I want a hot dog. <laughs> You're welcome. Catch episodes of Check Call Tuesdays at 12.30 on FreightWaves TV. Keep up with all things Check Call on FreightWaves.com slash Check Call. See you on the internet. It comes from XPO, being years ahead in experience and years ahead in technology. With artificial intelligence that helps us optimize how we roll our trailers, you first, and machine learning that accurately predicts market price fluctuation. World-class LTL freight transportation doesn't come from guesswork. It comes from precision. XPO, your freight first. Supply chains require plenty of prep, just like cooking. Without the right tools and ingredients, things don't turn out as planned. Luckily, Shipwell's advanced TMS solution has your recipe for success this produce season. A premium capacity network, end-to-end -end visibility, and the power to manage it all with one simple solution. Don't get burned this produce season. Satisfy your appetite for supply chain success with Shipwell. Join the shipping evolution. Welcome back to Freight Waves Now, everyone. I'm Isaiah Buchanan, and this is Social Roundabout, where we take a look at what's trending on social media. But one of my biggest fears while driving is being on the interstate or the highway and having one of my tires pop. Well, that happened to a driver here recently. CDL posted this video on TikTok just a couple of days ago, and this driver, as he's driving down the road, his tire is going to pop. You're gonna hear it, it's very loud, and you'll notice that when it does pop, right there, he doesn't freak out, he doesn't over try to overcorrect and swerve back onto the road. He puts his flashers on, and then he keeps, continues to drive until he can get to a safe space to pull over and begin trying to do, do repairs on his car. Um, driver did a really good job, has his flashers on to alert the other cars that are around him that something has happened and that he has to get off to the side of the road. Um, you can see now he's starting to pull over and um, he'll eventually come to a stop where he can start working on his truck. So props to that driver there. Um, other drivers take notes um, of what you should and shouldn't do if you have a tire pop on you while you're driving on the interstate or the highway. 
And now we, we know that we're starting to get a little bit closer to Halloween and pumpkins are a huge part of Halloween and growing the biggest one is always an accomplishment, right? Well, a man in Massachusetts just did that here over the weekend. Take a look at this picture. This was posted by Topsfield Fair. Um, this actually happened up in Massachusetts. It's a fair that goes on there and they do the heaviest pumpkin contest. And this man right here was the winner. His pumpkin weighed about 2,480 pounds, which is the new record for the biggest pumpkin in America. So the previous record was about 2,200 pounds, so he beat it by a significant amount of weight. Um, props to him, they had to use a forklift to just to drive the thing around and get it to the stay, get it to their quote unquote stage that they used for that fair. Um, just really cool that they were able to grow pumpkins of that size. I mean, 22, 2,400 pound pumpkins is just, those are enormous. So that's all I have for this edition of the Social Roundabout. But right now, we're gonna take a look at the last 24 hours in freight with our market update. Okay. Do you have plans first week in November? Um, let me look. Oh, you know what? I do, and so do you. What are we doing? We're going to F3. Oh, that's right, F3, Future Freight Festival. Only the biggest thing to happen in freight and logistics ever happening November 1st to November 3rd, and it's going to be a great time. It's gonna be a great time. Potentially the biggest thing that's happened, honestly, in the world. Yeah, yeah, I know it's gonna be the biggest thing in Chattanooga. It's gonna be, was it the Bonnaroo of freight? Bonnaroo of freight, okay. the Woodstock of freight. Yeah, and the big mm -hmm. thing is, is like, I always say this, and it's getting tired, but this is Freight Alley. Not Hotel Alley. Yeah, get your hotel accommodations made before this too late. I'm looking at the listings, and we already have some places that have been booked up, so prices are gonna start going up. I know this stuff, it's like economics 101. It's supply and demand, so be sure you get your hotels and accommodations made because you don't wanna miss this live music. You can still buy those tickets, get to FreightWaves.com. You don't wanna miss the JB Hunt after party either. That's the big Potentially thing. Potentially the funnest part of the night. And of course, we have some pretty big names for, I guess, speakers. One I'm gonna be excited about is gonna be Monte Dale, former linebacker from the University of Notre Dame and NFL veteran, and also talking about his uh, catfish experience and things like that, potentially. I don't think we're gonna ask him those questions. However, we also have a, an amazing lineup for our live performances. We just had a couple of them on screen. We've got Boyce Avenue, the Eli Young Band, some really great fans up here. Yeah. I'm excited. I'm excited too, and I'm excited to see all of you here in Freight Alley. We'll be hosting you all here. We'll be more than happy to have you. And we're gonna just be taking this party all throughout downtown Chattanooga. You get to see places like the aquarium, different parks, different venues, and it's definitely gonna be a fun time. We're gonna shut the city down just on your behalf, so hope to see you there. We're gonna be having everybody out on Station Street, folks, we will just see the Freight Waves headquarters office here in Chattanooga. So get those tickets, get that in, and uh, see you there.
Let's get this party started. Short break, but we'll be right back with more Freight Waves now. This is Efficiency in Action. It comes from XPO being years ahead in experience and years ahead in technology. With artificial intelligence that helps us optimize how we rode our trailers, you first, and machine learning that accurately predicts market price fluctuation. World-class FTL freight transportation doesn't come from guesswork. It comes from precision. XPO, your freight first. Shipwell knows supply chains require plenty of prep, just like cooking. Without the right tools and ingredients, things don't turn out as planned. Luckily, Shipwell's advanced TMS solution has your recipe for success this produce season. A premium capacity network, end-to-end -end visibility, and the power to manage it all with one simple solution. Don't get burned this produce season. Satisfy your appetite for supply chain success with Shipwell. Join the shipping evolution. Welcome back to Freight Waves Now. In this carrier update presented by Uptake, Donnie, we left off talking about tender reefer tender lead times moving higher. I mean, one of my questions to you, at least to start, I mean, we see it moving up as a kind of, you're talking about it being a reaction to what they're feeling. I mean, some of this, they just don't want to be, if the market changes, they don't want to be left out or? I think some of that is going on in both drive in and reefer. Mm -hmm. They don't want to mess up and lose their carriers right before the Thanksgiving and Christmas yeah. holidays. So the fourth quarter holiday season. But so it looks like here, we're right here. They're, they're, they're following the pattern, mm -hmm. same as last year. They're, just, they're, they're doing the same thing. Uh, it picked up here some in uh, 2019 and here 2020, but you see 2021 was the, of course, end up, we we're in a boom cycle, 2022. Uh, they're a little bit extended further out, just a little bit sooner. Mm -hmm. Now, are they, there, there is a missed opportunity going on here somewhere. Uh, are they just following the pattern, paying the higher rates? Would this allow for carriers to push up? And I believe this is what carriers could do, is try to push up on their uh, spot rates. Yep. Uh, a lot of them are falling back into compliance. We saw that with the, um, with the uh, rejection rate percentages. So in compliance, they're getting that, uh, I know they're roughly 20 cents or uh, below the drive end, so they're roughly 240 a mile plus fuel. <laughs> uh, so right now their spot rates are a lot lower than their contracts. So that would allow them to push up when you see these guys pushing their uh, lead times out, sh showing they're under a little bit of pressure. Yeah, I mean, I think you got to look at it. I mean, yeah, this only goes back to June, but I mean, we're, they're longer than what they were before the Labor Day. And there's not a holiday here right now, right? I mean, right. I guess there is, but it's not the same level as and Labor Day. If you're not watching the data and you're not seeing this, then you're missing an opportunity. If a, if this information got to all the reefer carriers right now and all the owner operators, uh, and that's probably one of the biggest problems is your single owner operators that don't know what's going or can't see the market changes as quickly as we can. <laughs> and here that's, you know, 50% plus of the capacity and they're just accepting cheap freight. That's going to keep those spot rates down yeah. if they saw this going on and they start pushing back on their prices, then they can push those spot rates up probably quite a bit. Yeah, it's one of those instances where they're 
they know they kind of know what the market's doing, but they don't really know it's changed anyway. They know they, they just want to keep their wheels moving. Yeah, they still have those guys out there that are taking that cheap freight to yep. keep their wheels moving, and it's really affecting all the others that are trying to push prices yep. up. All right, next chart here. <clears throat> so we're going to look at the uh, outbound tender rejection rate index, and we'll throw up on a seasonality map. So right now we are here in October, and you can see here uh, we've missed already one upward push in rates, rejection rates. Uh, that happened uh, through, you know, September. And we're really looking at what's going on right through here. Yep. So hopefully here in the next few weeks, this will be your opportunity by going by seasonal charts to really start pushing those rates up. I think you should start now. We see that the tender lead times have already started to push up. They need to get things together and start pushing those rates up here real soon and get their fourth quarter started. Yeah, I mean, that's the... That's the key, right? I mean, that's what that upward move in each of the last three years, it is seasonal. You see it as, think, I mean, you have Thanksgiving and you have Christmas and you have cold weather starting to hamper a lot of places that it's not like the first there'll be, a lot, there'll be a lot of goods that protect from freeze, yep. so it's the direct opposite, like paint. Exactly. Paint goes protect for freeze. They don't want that paint to uh, congeal. Mm -hmm. So they got to keep it above a certain temp. So you are correct, Tony. Absolutely. Well, Donnie, thank you so much for this update. We'll be sure to check in with you again a little later. Right now, we'll toss it back over to Sydney and Anthony. Hey guys, thanks so much for that Kara update. Sydney, it's time to welcome our next guest. We've been just so fortunate with our guest this morning, and it continues with the brilliant Eric Coolidge. And he's going to tell us a little bit about that air cargo and the peak season that we might be having, or maybe it's deteriorating a little bit. Eric, thanks so much for joining us this morning. Hey, thank you so much, Anthony. Thanks for having me on. So Eric, tell us, what are we seeing? What might be happening here with air cargo? Well, you know, it's interesting. Uh, you know, I, I don't think it's specific to air cargo necessarily. In fact, the National Retail Federation on Friday put out a a statement um, and their court tracker showing that, um, you know, late uh, season December TU import volumes will be at their lowest level since uh, the beginning of uh, 2021. And basically, we're just seeing overall trade and imports slowing, basically, you know, kind of a relatively strong first half of the year, but then the peak season just hasn't happened. And, and a lot of that has to do with all the pre-buying and the inventory pull um, early on because people didn't want to, um, you know, run into supply chain disruptions. And, and now, you know, the numbers are starting to show that in air cargo, we've got you know, depending on which uh, rating agency or benchmarking uh, data firm you look at, the rates are roughly down in September, um, you know, from about 10 to 20 percent globally. But that can change, you know, by specific trade lane. Fredos is showing numbers for, you know, month over month uh, decline of about 32 percent on, on China to North America and about uh, net 20 percent on China to Europe. So, you know, those are that's kind of what's going on there. But the, the interesting thing is, you know, despite all that and all the hand wringing, you know, the 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 market's still pretty good relative to 2019. I mean, volumes are getting closer um, to 2019 levels, which was kind of a weaker year for air cargo. But the rates are still, you know, 80 to, you know, 100% more. So it's all kind of relative. And Eric, with this easing demand and such a pull forward and increasing capacity, um, do you see that there will still be that um, really rush of investment or really investment or interest in air cargo space that we saw probably, you know, at the beginning of the year, really kind of persisting into the latter half of this year and into 2023? Well, you know, I think you're, people will be a little bit more cautious. I mean, you've seen, uh, you know, FedEx took that big uh, earnings miss and, and reported that their uh, upcoming quarter their, or their current quarter, they're going to have, uh, you know, like $500 million dollar um, shortfall in operating income and Amazon Air has said they're going to, well, they haven't said it, but uh, analysis shows that they're kind of cutting back on their flight activity and fleet expansion. They're still growing, but at a slower pace. So I think, you know, people be a little bit more cautious, but I think the overall trend is, is up because 
or, or we'll continue to invest in new freighters and converted freighters because you know, long-term projections are for air cargo to compound at an annual growth rate of maybe three to four percent, and you know that that uh, you know that's pretty significant. And then on top of it, you've got e-commerce uh, growing, and and I think that the thing that's really changed is how people are viewing the the passenger market. That there's you know it's still going to take a couple of years for the passenger market to fully get back to pre-pandemic levels, and all that cargo is carried in the in the bellies of those passenger planes. And then beyond that, the passenger plane market is going to be a little smaller or less reliable. I think there's just recognition that these passenger aircraft can be um, diverted or have flights canceled or, you know, are just not as reliable. And if you're a shipper that needs to maintain supply chains, you're going to want that guaranteed capacity with a freighter. And Eric, I think that's a great point you make there. I mean, as even though we're seeing that um, some volumes might be coming down, as you mentioned in the article, is still well above where we were before the pandemic. Um, do you see any kind of uh, interesting partnerships or consolidations or anything like that really being a potential possibility as we continue to move uh, forward in the developments and the growth in air cargo? Um, well, I mean, you see um, free forwarders partnering more with airlines uh, or, you know, chartering more aircraft on a consistent basis. And, and you've got airlines like Air Canada, you know, doing innovative things to basically starting their own freighter uh, divisions. So, you know, you're, you're, you're seeing more of that and, you, and you're seeing, um, you know, kind of retailers or e-commerce platforms, as we've discussed before, kind of get their own, have their own airline capacity kind of in the same way that Amazon has its, you know, private airline. Others are similarly doing that kind of thing. They may not fly the planes themselves, but they control the whole network. You know, they outsource and hire the, the contractors to do that flying for them. And Eric, I'm glad you brought up Air Canada. You put out an article not too long ago about them. Can you talk to about what's going on there in that article and what's going on with them in Boeing? Yeah, well, Air Canada is a, just a, a very innovative and interesting company. They. Um, you know, it's interesting, they used to have freighters back in the day, uh, 30, 40 years ago, all kinds of uh, different freighters along with their passenger aircraft. And then over the years, they, the economics just didn't work and they weren't as focused on it. So they, they phased those out and the last, I think they were leasing a few uh, planes 20 years ago, got rid of those. And now they've come full circle. They're you know, they they realize during the pandemic cargo is valuable, so they and can diversify their revenue. So they they are bringing uh, eight Boeing seven six sevens that they used on their passenger side. They retire them. They're converting them into freighters. They have two of them already, and they've been flying routes to Latin America and Miami, and then to Europe. And um, they announced last week that they're adding a couple more destinations, uh, Dallas and Atlanta, and also Bogota, Colombia. But they didn't say anything else about that. So I checked, and it looks like they're getting their third. That's going to be enabled now by their third freighter they're getting from the conversion house. So that'll allow them to add these extra stops. Um, and as you mentioned, they've also ordered recently uh, a couple of Boeing 777, really large aircraft to directly from Boeing. So those will be factory built planes uh, coming in the next couple of years. And that was going to be my next question to you, Eric. What's the timeline looking like for this uh, expansion here for them? Um, you know, I think it's a gradual. So they've got three of the converted uh, freighters. The, um, a few more, they'll have a few more by early next year and the, the full complement of eight by sometime in 2023 then um they've also um ordered a couple boeing six uh seven uh, six sevens from boeing so those will come in the next year or so and then the triple sevens i think are a couple more years out so you're probably looking at 2024 when before they have their a full fleet of about a dozen uh, all cargo planes eric thank you so much for joining us this morning where can people find out more what might you be working on next 
Um, I'm looking at a story, you know, uh, Delta Airlines uh, just concluded its joint venture, got approval from the USDOT for their joint venture with LATAM Airlines, a, a big South American carrier. Most people focus on the passenger side of that. I'm going to just uh, look at some of the cargo benefits of that JV coming into place. Um, so, yeah, just FreightWaves.com on the air uh, section or AmericanShipper.com, you'll find, the, find my stuff. Excellent, Eric. And before we let you go, um, where, where can people find you? So if they want to reach out to you with any stories or anything like that, how can they get a hold of you? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm on Twitter at Eric Reports. You can find me on LinkedIn and message me. And my email is ecoolish at freightwaves.com. Awesome, Eric. Well, thanks so much for being here. Always insightful and always great having you on. Hey, thanks a lot, Anthony. Take care. Take care. Right now, we're going to head over to the headline updates with the one, the only, Sydney Edwards. With a full look at our top stories of the day, I'm Sydney Edwards. Now, for the first time in recent history, FedEx and UPS will likely not assume the same annual general rate increase as their competitor. After years of keeping its GRI between 4.9 and 5.9 percent, FedEx hit the market last month with a 6.9 percent increase, higher than many had expected and the largest year-over-year -year increase in its history. Now, UPS has yet to announce its GRI, and the jury is still out as to where it will fall. UPS releases its third quarter results on October 25th, and it's a reasonably safe bet it will publish its 2023 rates on or before then. Satish Jindal, the founder and president of UPS, could come in lower because it has a better handle on its cost structure than FedEx. Now, the brokerage model for complying with California's AB5 law got another vote as the most likely solution in a research note published by Cohen Transportation Analyst Jason Seidel. Now, Seidel held a private roundtable discussion with unidentified executives who are likely to be affected by the state's restrictive law on independent contractors, as well as an attorney. Now, after the roundtable, Seidel published his report backing the brokerage model in which a trucking company transitions to being mostly a brokerage and brokers for into independent owner operators. Now, but those independent oper owner operators would need to get their own authority and insurance if they're now driving under the banner of a company providing those necessities. The other most likely option for complying with AB5, Seidel says, is making drivers employees, a step that was most visible in a recent decision by Universal Logistics. New York-based Altana Technologies says it has landed a $100 million Series B investment led by Activate Capital. The supply chain management software startup said the raise will support its goal of using AI to provide visibility across the global supply chain. Other participants in the Series B round include Omer's Ventures, Prologis Ventures, ReefNot Investments, and Four More Capital. Existing investors, GV, formerly Google Ventures, Amadeus Capital Partners, Floating Point, and Ridgeline Partners all joined the round. The company raised $15 million in a Series A round in September of 2021. And golf fans looking for a new outfit to pair with their golf game for next spring can now take advantage of convenient pickup options being offered through via dot dot via dot delivery. The buy online pick up anywhere delivery technology company has inked a deal to provide its services to Perry Ellis and its associated brands. Via dot delivery offers more than 21,000 pickup locations, including inside pharmacies, grocery stores, gas stations, and convenience stores. The Menlo California based company leverages technology to offer e-commerce shoppers convenient pickup at physical store locations. And that headline is mostly for Tony Mulvey here. Now, as search and rescue efforts continue in areas decimated by Hurricane Ian, nonprofit trucking and logistics companies are stepping up to help those hardest hit by the Category 4 storm. Trucks with Room to Spare's president, Shelley conway Wah says the group has a list of rules and regulations for volunteers who have collected disaster relief supplies to ensure the group can safely accept the shipments. Convoy of Hope, a faith-based nonprofit headquartered in Springfield, Missouri, has more than 50 trucks already on the ground or en route to the disaster zone. That's according to Ethan Foreheads, the national spokesperson for the charity. Now, for those headlines and so much more information, you can log on to FreightWaves.com. If you're watching us on our YouTube channel, don't forget to like and subscribe to stay updated. You can get the full FreightWaves TV experience by heading on over to our FreightWaves app or logging on to TV.FreightWaves.com. After this break, we'll have the hot seat. Stay tuned.
This is Efficiency in Action. It comes from XPO, being years ahead in experience and years ahead in technology. With artificial intelligence that helps us optimize how we roll our trailers, you first, and machine learning that accurately predicts market price fluctuation. World-class LTL freight transportation doesn't come from guesswork. It comes from precision. XPO, your freight first. What does this have to do with freight? Well, I'm glad you asked. People are wondering what's going to happen with inflation. Is there going to be hyperinflation? When is hyperinflation going to be here? When is there going to be inflation? What's going to happen with inflation? Inflation, inflation, inflation. This is the sexiest topic within the economy right now. Shipwell knows supply chains require plenty of prep, just like cooking. Without the right tools and ingredients, things don't turn out as planned. Luckily, Shipwell's advanced TMS solution has your recipe for success this produce season. A premium capacity network, end-to-end -end visibility, and the power to manage it all with one simple solution. Don't get burned this produce season. Satisfy your appetite for supply chain success with Shipwell. Join the shipping evolution. Now, Freight Waves might not pick favorites as a company, but as an individual, I have my favorites. <laughs> Sydney, you're too kind. <laughs> and one of my favorite people here at Freight Waves is Thomas Watson. Uh, I can't be mad at that. He's hilarious, he's smart, he's insightful, and you never know what it's gonna say next. And yeah. he always has something hilarious to say. And we have an upcoming segment. It's one of my favorite segments that have mm -hmm. been added to Freight Waves as of lately. It's called The Hot Seat. That's where uh, Thomas Watson is going to be put in the hot seat. Our producer, Bill Priestley, will be asking the hard questions. And uh, like Anthony said, we really never really know what Thomas is going to say. Yeah, and it's kind of scary. So like he <laughs> has like this wall of fire behind him and it's very menacing, but I enjoy the it. And it's in entertaining and it's insightful, but be sure to enjoy this segment of The Hot Seat. Once again, 10 questions for an unsuspecting individual. They have to answer them all. And today, ladies and gentlemen, we have a special guest. It is none other than Thomas Watson, loaded and rolling host. How are you, sir? I'm doing well, Bill. I am ready and not prepared for what's about to be asked. <laughs> awesome. Because <laughs> I'm going to throw 10 questions at you. I need 10 answers. You ready? Let's go. All right. Number one, normally I would ask, what is the number one problem your company or organization is trying to solve? But because we've done a few freight waves personalities, I'm switching that to what's the best piece of advice you've ever been given in the freight industry fake it till you make it <laughs> and why it's because oftentimes they're not going to train you for what you need to do and you're only going to find out by messing it up so trying to have a brave face as you're navigating through the chaos is super important to instill confidence all right then number two what's the best book you've ever read that has helped you in the industry uh, this one, I would say Truckload Transportation by Leo Lazarus. But that's a very technical one. My personal favorite is How to Fail at Everything and Still Win Big by uh, Scott Adams, creator of Dilbert. Very good. All right. You're in a cross-country hall, and you have only one artist that you can listen to for your 1,000-mile trip. Who are you picking? Country artist? Of, of any genre. Oh, oh, man. Uh, Including uh, Synth Wave including Synthwave. Uh, I'm gonna have to go with, oh, that's a really, really tough one. Let's go with Led Zeppelin. It's got a little bit of everything. All right.
right, excellent there. Uh, number four, uh, you get a chance to have dinner with anyone in freight, living or dead. Who do you have, who do you want to have dinner with? The person who invented the wheel. I need to find out who they are, but they started this whole revolution. You can turn it into a cart or even a truck. We just gotta figure out who they are and where they are. And then you take them out to dinner, I'm sure that it'd be much better than what they're used to. <laughs> Great, well put. Number five, uh, this is a tough one, so you can take a minute to think if you'd like. Who is on your Mount Rushmore of freight? Ooh, that, that would be really cool. I would say um, General Sherman. He did his march to the sea in Atlanta, but in order to do so, he needed a lot of logistics. And I think that would be really, really interesting because the American Civil War did provide uh, a great example for future wars on how to do logistics and intermodal, in addition to the fact that some primary sources mentioned that even troops were willing to rebel if they didn't get their coffee delivered. Wow, anybody else on that uh, list of four? Uh, I would also say that uh, the folks who, whoever came up with uh, the Red Ball Express in World War II, I don't know if that was Omar Bradley or Eisenhower, but uh, the fact that they managed to do nonstop resupply, that would be pretty, pretty legit to, to learn about. All right, I'll leave you with those two then as well. Uh, number six, you've had some great, as we call them, wassonisms on television. What's your favorite line you've ever said on TV? Oh, gosh. Um, there's never a favorite one. They all are just very spontaneous. Uh, so I would, I would have to say the one that I haven't come up with yet, it's going to be my favorite. All right, that's a good answer. Um, number seven, what's the best meal you've ever had when on the road? In other words, you're going through a town or maybe you're just stopping for a day. You go to a place, the meal blows you away. Where were you and what did you have? I would have to say the best meal quite literally on the side of the road was when I was in Germany and it was a Döner kebab where they had this giant piece of meat that was just slow roasting and they shaved it off and stuck it together and handed it to you. I was very hungover at the time, but it was by far the best street eats slash walking driving. And it was just on the side, you know, you're just downtown random kebab stand. They were, they were great folks. Sometimes that can be the best, the best medicine at all times. Uh, number eight, the greatest unsolved problem in freight right now is? Right now it's basically uh, how to be more efficient while also still making money. Uh, because right now a big problem with trucking is utilization and uh, the factors are you're always competing against the supply chain. So you can drive your trucks very efficiently, but it's always the place you're picking up or delivering that keeps slowing you down. So that's the biggest problem in freight is how would you speed it up? Okay, number nine, name something you think will be mainstream in 10 years that is not mainstream now. Oh man, I'm gonna say, uh, for trucking in particular, I wanna say exclusive truck stops. You know, everyone complains that truck stops are, you know, lacking or disgusting. I'm waiting for someone to have like the VIP truck stop where you have to be like a paid member to come to this cool truck stop. And then everyone's gonna wanna come to the cool truck stop. Excellent, all right, and last one. Complete this sentence, freight is blank. The illusion of control. <laughs> Freight Th chaos. Thomas Watson, you are off the hot seat. This is Efficiency in Action. It comes from XPO, being years ahead in experience and years ahead in technology. With artificial intelligence that helps us optimize how we load our trailers, you first, and machine learning that accurately predicts market price fluctuation. World-class FTL freight transportation doesn't come from guesswork. It comes from precision. XPO, your freight first.
Shipwell knows supply chains require plenty of prep, just like cooking. Without the right tools and ingredients, things don't turn out as planned. Luckily, Shipwell's advanced TMS solution has your recipe for success this produce season. A premium capacity network, end-to-end -end visibility, and the power to manage it all with one simple solution. Don't get burned this produce season. Satisfy your appetite for supply chain success with Shipwell. Join the shipping evolution. Welcome back to Freightways Now on this final carrier update in the morning. Going to get into our length of the day, Donnie, here, starting in the northeast. So first, go to your toggle up top here, turn your reefer on, yep. and then start throwing your lanes in. Where are the best paying lanes, Tony? The places that nobody wants to run, the northeast. So throw in Baltimore, Maryland. This is kind of in that beltway area, I call it. Baltimore, uh, New Jersey, uh, Pennsylvania, right through here. Mm -hmm. This is the beltway that leads all the freight up in the Northeast. The Northeast tends to absorb a lot more freight than it does produce. Yep. So therefore nobody really wants to go there as much. And it's also a very dense population area. So run in, uh, it's 407 miles at about 550 a mile. Um, it's a pretty strong rate for a reefer right now, especially when your uh, average freight for, uh, even though it's really dry van, is about 270 right now, 268. Yeah, but it has you going right through the heart of New York City. I mean, you are going through New York and that traffic can't be- Might be trouble. a good night run. Yeah. <laughs> run at night, sleep during the day, run back at night. But it's 550 a mile, Tony. Yeah. You look at some of the others, it's just $2 more a mile than a lot of the others. Yep. Hit your little double arrow switch, flip this around, Boston coming back, Tony. We're still at $3.88. So you look at, you know, you, you, you can average four bucks a mile on this. A lot stronger, a lot better than a lot of the other lanes. But you are, well, I mean, 413, 400 miles up, 400 miles back. You're about 100 miles short a day. You can still do pretty good on your revenue per, per truck per day. Yeah, I mean, at worst, it's what? A day up and a day back. I mean, especially when you start factoring in the traffic that, it's, it's probably bearable at f over $4 a mile on the average. Yes. All right, next lane. Pop in here. Let's move over. Memphis to Kansas City. Uh, again, uh, it's a 450-mile run, so it's mm -hmm. still a pretty good run. Nowhere near the congestion or the traffic. Uh, so we're hitting 451 miles, but at $3.28 a mile. Yeah. Again, we want to see that spot of 350 or higher, but that's that's tough to get. We're still over $3 a mile. Uh, hit the little double arrows and flip this back around. Kansas City came back to Memphis. We're at 406 though. So here we're still, you know, ab above that 350 average yeah. for this lane and it's 450 miles. So this is something that you could get in the habit of again, one day up, one day back, one day up, one day back. If you plan your uh, loads and uh, deliveries appropriately, then this would be a very profitable lane for you. Yeah, I mean, it's what, 360 a mile, right on the average or something in the- 453. Yeah, so I mean, then you factor in the gap there isn't that much traffic on this one compared to that Northeast run. So it is, there's options out there. It's just what fits best in for you. Get better gas mileage running the slower speeds. One last lane here right quick. Uh, Columbia, South Carolina to Atlanta, uh, 461 a mile, a lot shorter run. It's only 200 miles, 215 miles. Uh, flipping around, coming back, <clears throat> we're at 475. Now, I do want to put and let people understand the reason I put this lane in there. This could be a female lane right now. I've seen on social media where brokers are really pushing these rates down on FEMA loads, disaster relief loads. <clears throat> FEMA will pay a driver a fair wage, a good strong rate for their lanes. <laughs> if you're getting them through a broker and they're being pushed down, the brokers are pushing the rates down 
not FEMA. So push those rates back up or don't accept them. Brokers will try to pay you a low rate and brokers will try not to pay you detention. And FEMA will pay those brokers the, the strong wage or lane uh, rate per mile and they will pay those guys detention. And you're just getting at them so they can make a higher profit. Keep that in mind. Awesome stuff, Donnie. Thank you for this update. We'll be sure to check in with you again tomorrow. Right now, we'll toss it over to Isaiah Buchanan with the last look at the social roundabout. Welcome into Social Roundabout, everyone. I'm Isaiah Buchanan, and in this segment, we take a look at what's trending on social media. One of my biggest fears while driving is having a tire blowout when I'm driving on the interstate or a highway, and just having that happen and not really knowing how to react to that certain situation. Well, this driver, this video was posted to TikTok, and this driver had this happen to him. He was driving it on his route um, at night, and you'll be able to hear when his tire blows out, and you'll see how he manages to blows out right there. You can see that he doesn't overreact and try to swerve back onto the road. He's gradually trying to slow down. He puts on his flashers for the traffic around him to see that something has happened. He doesn't try to hit his brakes to slow down real fast. He tries to decelerate naturally, um, downshifting, and, and he safely gets over to the side of the road so that others um, can continue to drive on and that he can start uh, trying to work on that truck. Um, so good, good job by that driver there. And then um, if you need some pointers on what to do, that's it for you right there. There. Now, take a look at this great gourd. This was um, a pumpkin that was grown and was at a contest up in Massachusetts. It's a 2,480 pound pumpkin. It actually sets the record for the heaviest pumpkin in North America. The previous record was about 2,200 pounds. So that one's a pretty decent size larger than the one that had the record before. They had to use a forklift to be able to get it to its quote unquote stage to be weighed and everything else. So, I mean, these pumpkins that people are growing are absolutely massive. I don't really know how they get them to be that big, but I just thought that it was really cool to see that a 2,400 pound pumpkin. That's all I have for this edition of the Social Roundabout. Right now, I'm gonna toss things over to Bill Priestley for our round table. And welcome into the roundtable. Bill Priestley here with you. And today we're going to be talking about the changing world of shipping and what can be going on with new ship builds. And with that, two experts joining us here, Rachel Premack, our editorial director uh, here at Freight Waves, and also Dr. Sal Mercagliano, associate professor of history at Campbell University. Both of you, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we're highlighting, of course, Rachel's article here that came out of her mode series. And I want to throw up this chart uh, fairly quickly here. In other words, th this is a chart that came out of that, uh, that uh, article and shows a dramatic, if I can use that term, uh, increase in the number of ships that are being built or at least ordered over the course of the next few years. And uh, Rachel, I just want to talk to you because this comes out of a conversation you had with our own Greg Miller. How surprised were you to see this, this chart? Given your talk with Greg Miller, what, what does this represent? This represents to me this idea that, uh, we, and we've seen it over the course of the past few decades, that uh, in transportation, uh, let's say you have a cycle that has particularly strong demand and reduced capacity, uh, those companies will respond by building more and more capacity and really doubling down and making sure that they can accommodate all of that demand. But you know, these sort of spikes in demand, they're not permanent. So at the same time that demand will start to soften as we're already seeing, all of this capacity will come on board and this could really trigger, uh, you know, a, a serious downturn in the shipping industry. Yeah, so to this point, you, I mean, you, you, you kind of alluded to this a little bit a while ago when we were talking about IMO 2020, about ships going to the scrapyard, new ships being built, but does this graphic surprise you at all? No, it doesn't. I mean, you got a couple of things going on here, obviously, right from the beginning. You have the shipping companies with more cash in their hands than ever before. A lot of companies have put off ship replacement programs for quite a while. And so they're going to start taking that money and use it. But you also have CEOs like Soren Skew over at Maersk, who's talking about the fact that, listen, I'm going to need 5 to 15% more capacity than I currently have once IMO 2023 goes into effect, which is the new regulation that's about to come into effect here that's going to, again, slow ships down. It's going to require vessels to 
basically calibrate and document their carbon export and how much they're uh, emitting. And this means that they're going to need more capacity sooner rather than later. And that's why you see that capacity coming online in 2023-2024. Add to it, we're going to start seeing some countries that are going to outlaw the use of scrubbers on board vessels. We already see a big problem with getting scrubber waste. This is the material, the water that's used to uh, basically clean exhaust from vessels that are burning the older, cheaper fuel. But that's going to start going away. So you're going to have to have this technology begin to transition, which is why we're seeing so many vessels right now in the hopper. Rachel, let me go back to you there. Uh, the, it looks dangerous, obviously, when you put that much capacity on the market and, and as things start to scrap down, a bit, how, how dangerous slash risky is this? I mean, we're talking, if you look at that chart again, you see that that number generally kind of has this gradual incline and then all of a sudden you have this massive uh, increase. Uh, is, is this dangerous? Is this risky according to your talk with Greg Miller? Yeah, so Greg told me that uh, both the companies that lease these ships to uh, carriers like like Marisk or Hapa Lloyd, uh, as well as the carriers themselves, such as Marisk or Hapa Lloyd, they have tons of cash uh, in hand in the coffers from the past few years of this amazing uh, boom in the shipping industry we've seen. So, uh, you know, just, just looking at uh, their current financial state, given the fact that they do have so much cash on hand, uh, it's, it, it's less likely that we will see a sort of major downturn in shipping like what we saw in the mid-2010s. Uh, but this is certainly not an ideal situation for those companies to be in. Yeah, Sal, same question to you there. Do, how risky is this when you put that much capacity into the market? Granted, yes, you are scrapping ships at the same time. Does this look dangerous or risky to you? No, I mean, we haven't started scrapping yet. So that's one of the big things we haven't seen. I mean, ships have not been going. They haven't showed up in Along and Bangladesh and India yet to be run aground. But that's going to start happening here very soon soon. But companies like Costamere and Danos and Atlas and C-SPAN, you know, they've got locked in contracts. They're the money makers of, of the container companies right now. They've got their leases in place. They're going to get paid whether the ships are sailing or not. What we're seeing right now is the container companies, the big operators, the Maersks, the MSCs, they're looking to figure out what vessels they need for this interim before you get to 2050 and the new, you know, let's go completely green. Let's go to 50% emission free. Remember, we have some spots right now that are talking about green corridors. You, you've heard this talk between Shanghai and LA about creating a green corridor, no emissions whatsoever. You have to have specific vessels for this. And so a lot of these companies are really hedging their bet here on what is that next technology? And you know whether it's green methanol, whether it's LNG, there's a lot of costs associated with investing in this interim technology until the final technology comes to fruition in a few decades. Uh, Rachel, do you get a sense from, from your talk and from your, re your research that this was a needed change or was this a wanted change just because all these uh, ocean carriers do indeed have a lot of, of cash to spend? Right. Well, as, as Sal mentioned, we a lot of these carriers are, are running ships that are way past their prime, way past when they normally would be running them. Sure. Uh, these are ships that are pretty inefficient, both in, uh, especially particularly when you look at uh, fuel and environmental standards, they are pretty inefficient. Uh, so they, they really do need to dump some of these inefficient older ships and get some, get some newer builds on board. So uh, maybe not the uh, 3 million TUs that are getting delivered in 2024. That might be a stretch, but certainly these companies did need new vessels in their, um, in their arsenal. Yeah, Let, let's go back to that chart one more time because one other thing that it does show is that the, not only are the number of ships being ordered uh, increasing, but the size of those ships uh, is increasing as well. Um, if we could throw that chart up back up one more time. Um, Sal, as you, as you look at that, you, this is a commitment to obviously building much larger boats at the same time. How is this perhaps maybe changing the industry as we see it? Well, you know, I go back to an earlier article that Rachel did that really broke down what type of vessels are being built. And one of the groups you're seeing built in, in this group right now that's going to be coming out in 2023 and 2024 are these Neo Panamax vessels, these vessels that can go both through the new lane of the Panama Canal and through the Suez Canal. And what that does is it gives the operating companies a lot of flexibility 
in their tonnage. They can put those vessels on the Trans-Pacific route. They can run from the East Asia to the West Coast of the United States, or they can swing through the Panama Canal and head to the East and Gulf, Gulf Coast. We're also seeing a new breed of uh, smaller feeder vessels coming in, and we're seeing a little bit less of the ultra-large container vessels, the huge monsters, the 24,000 TEU vessels. But what we're seeing is a growth in the large size. Remember, the Panama Canal, the Neo Panamax Lane, is growing in size of vessel going through there. We just had a vessel over 15,000 boxes go through that lane. And so as, that, as those vessels are conformed to that lane, we're going to see bigger and bigger ships that can go through there. Yeah, Rachel, to, and you wrote the article. What is, what is this new change and shift towards larger ships meaning for the industry as far as your research uh, indicates? Yeah, so it's interesting because when you look at 2024 deliveries, they're actually about maybe a little bit larger, but they're they're about the same as 2015 deliveries, which was that last sort of record uh, number of ship deliveries we've seen in the past uh, 20 or so years. Uh, so it, it looks like, uh, at least from my reading of the graph, is that uh, uh, these carriers are starting to acclimate to uh you know smaller ships or at least not trying to get to that 24,000 25,000 although such ships have been manufactured um in in recent months but it it does seem like there is some sort of maybe not leveling off but uh the the mac the the huge jumps in growth the huge uh increases in size might be might be slowing down and that that does track with recent studies that show that, you know, 24,000, 25,000 TUs, that's the point where it's no longer, get, getting any larger than that is not any more efficient for the shipping companies themselves. At that point, uh, we just don't even have the correct port infrastructure to, to accommodate ships like that. And that's even including, uh, you know, these highly updated ports in Europe or in East Asia. So it does seem like there is a gradual kind of coming around or acceptance of this idea that bigger isn't necessarily better, but we will definitely see, uh, you know, in the coming years if that, if, if those 24,000, 25,000 TU ships are, aren't uh, adopted. Zal, uh, let me leave the last word to you here. Let me put your, your, your crystal ball in front of you. Three, four years down the road, when you look at maybe where shipping is, obviously it's incredibly hard to predict what's going to happen tomorrow. But looking at that, um, where do you see maybe best case scenario, worst case scenario for shippers and these new builds that they're ordering? Well, I think we got a couple of issues, obviously, with the IMO 2023. We're going to see ships slowing down, and that's going to require more capacity. This is why SKU, in the, uh, an interview not too long ago, sat there and said he needs more capacity out there. But I also think that the big variable here is what are ports and countries going to do about their emission standards? What we're seeing is an acceleration of IMO 2050 pushing forward here. And as you do that, that requires, again, a wholesale rebuilding of the fleets, which requires huge amounts of money to do that. And right now, what we're going to see is really a large-scale scrapping start to take place. I mean, there's, there's a lot of tonnage out there that doesn't need to be sailing anymore. It's completely fuel inefficient. And what you're seeing right now is these kind of peaks of we're going to build like crazy. We're going to get an interim set of vessels out there that can operate for about a 10, 15-year period. And then we're going to have to build again to get to that next level. And I think that's what we're seeing right now. We're just seeing the opportunity with money in their pockets. They're going to invest in this and get themselves some tonnage that they can run for the next 10, 15 years. Yeah, definitely a changing world as far as shipping is concerned. Rachel Premax, Sal Mercagliano, thanks so much for joining us and uh, have a great rest of your week. Thank you. Thanks. All right, we will take a break and we will come back with more for what was now after this. Shipwell knows supply chains require plenty of prep, just like cooking. Without the right tools and ingredients, things don't turn out as planned. Luckily, Shipwell's advanced TMS solution has your recipe for success this produce season. A premium capacity network, end-to-end -end visibility, and the power to manage it all with one simple solution. Don't get burned this produce season. Satisfy your appetite for supply chain success with Shipwell. Join the shipping evolution. 
This is Efficiency in Action. It comes from XPO, being years ahead in experience and years ahead in technology. With artificial intelligence that helps us optimize how we load our trailers, you first, and machine learning that accurately predicts market price fluctuation. World-class LTL freight transportation doesn't come from guesswork. It comes from precision. XPO, your freight first. Sydney Edwards. Now, golf fans looking for a new outfit to pair with their golf game for next spring can now take advantage of convenient pickup options being offered through Via Dot Delivery. The Buy Online Pick Up Anywhere delivery technology company has inked a deal to provide its services to Perry Ellis and its associated brands. Via Dot Delivery offers more than 21,000 pickup locations, including inside pharmacies, grocery stores, gas stations, and convenience stores. The Menlo, California based company leverages technology to offer for e-commerce shoppers, convenient pickup at physical store locations. As search and rescue efforts continue in areas decimated by Hurricane Ian, nonprofit trucking and logistics companies are stepping up to help those hit hardest by the Category 4 storm. Trucks with Room to Spare's President Shelley Conway Waugh says the group has a list of rules and regulations for volunteers who have collected disaster relief supplies to ensure the group can safely accept the shipments. Convoy of Hope, a faith based nonprofit headquartered in Springfield, Missouri, has more than 50 trucks already on the ground or en route to the disasters. Zone. That's according to Ethan Forhetz, the national spokesperson for the charity. And FedEx Ground is adjusting its holiday traffic forecast due to an increasingly pronounced slowdown in demand. That's according to someone familiar with the matter. In a statement late on Friday, the FedEx Corporation Ground Delivery Union unit said that weakening macroeconomic conditions are causing volume softness. The unit also said that it is collaborating with customers on their projected shipping needs and making adjustments as necessary to ensure it can meet its delivery commitments. It did not provide any specific numbers, and the news of FedEx's move was first reported by Reuters. Now you can find those headlines and so much more at FreightWaves.com and on our FreightWaves app. For the full FreightWaves TV experience, however, you can head on over to tv.freightwaves.com. We're going to hand this back on over to Anthony Smith for the rest of the show. Awesome. Thank you, Sydney, for those look at today's headlines. And thank you all so much for tuning in this morning for this Monday edition of Freight Waves Now. <clears throat> We've had tons of insights throughout this morning with, of course, Rachel Premack, who you just saw, Sal McCargliano, and many more that join us, Mary McConnell. And the fun and insights continue in just about an hour. We have What the Truck coming up a little bit later. We also have the stock out and the drop zone that's going to be airing on a little bit later on this afternoon as well. The fun also continues tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. until 11 a.m. for another edition of Freight Waves Now. And of course, if you haven't already, I'm going to say it one more time, be sure to get those F3 tickets purchased and those accommodations made because it's going to be the Freight Festival you don't want to miss coming up November 1st to November 3rd. That's going to be it for this episode and we'll see you tomorrow. Find load coverage 70% faster and save time on track and trace with bulk actions within Thai TI.